Hi there and welcome to your lectures for week 12 of Contemporary Art. Today we're going to look at one of the things that sort of emerges in the late 80s and 90s as a trend that is, again, like everything else that we're looking at, really tied up in some of the same questions and concerns that have been raised over the course of the semester about uh, the idea of originality and authorial genius and um, the place of tradition in art history. It plays out in a particular way, particularly in the 90s, in a, a movement that is sometimes called the appropriationist movement, where you have these artists who literally are looking at earlier artists, um, especially 20th century artists, and just basically taking their work and putting it into, an, taking the work of other artists, putting it into a new context and calling it um, their own art. So this appropriation movement is literally where artists appropriate the work of another artist and reuse it. And um, this raises up all kinds of questions about originality and copyright and, um, you know, where does creativity lie? Is it in the original artist making an object or is there some other layer that's added when another artist takes it and reuses it in a different context? Uh, and this is all, especially in the 90s, something that is heavily influenced by postmodernist theory. Now, we've already looked a little bit at postmodernism in the arts, and we've seen hints of it in work of people like Jeff Koons, who are uh, blending a kind of um, historicizing look at the past uh, and commentary on the past with modern media and modern materials, things like that. Um, we're also, and, or the, you know, the, the work of Michael Graves where he, he turns the caryatids into the seven dwarves for the Disney building in um, L.A. Now we're seeing it also in a more theoretical way in the work of these artists in the 90s, particularly um, in the work of an artist named Sherry Levine. Sherry Levine starts out doing stuff in the 70s. Here she's got a, a photo collage where she's appropriated, basically, this is advertising photography images that she's cut into, and so she's appropriated that. She's appropriated the, um, the profile of Lincoln from the penny, and she's combined these together into this um, untitled collage, which obviously has some implicit commentary going on. Uh, the relationship between the world of fashion and the world of commerce and money and, um, you know, a critique maybe of consumer culture, which was the kind of thing that was very much on the minds of artists in the late 70s, particularly feminist artists who were starting to really work with uh, and question the images of women presented in the media and the use of uh, the female body to sell goods and services. And we've seen some of that, if you've read um, some of the stuff about the Gorilla Girls or looking at the work of Barbara Kruger, there's some of that going on in the 70s. And Levine comes out of that tradition. By the 90s, the early 90s, she started doing work that's more specifically looking not just at the general world of commerce and culture and how images of women are um, treated there, but looking specifically at the history of art and questioning the way the history of art has been written. So, for example, by the late 70s and then into the 80s and 90s, she's doing these works where she takes the work of other photographers, and in this one it's Walker Evans, a very famous photographer from the Depression era. She basically takes photographs of Walker Evans and makes photographs of them and to calls her prints untitled, in this case, after Walker Evans, and, you know, makes herself the author of this photograph of a photograph. Now, I mean, this is the kind of thing that drives people nuts, you know, this is the kind of thing that makes people just go crazy when they're looking at the, the world of art, but what she's doing here is not just trying to take the easy way out and, you know, get her work into galleries, but she's actually doing something where, I mean, the concept is what's most important to her, right? The, the kind of raising the issue of what is the art object and what is the artist's creativity and really kind of trying to challenge the whole idea of artist with a capital A as this special um, genius who has a particularly um, unique and singular vision. That is something that we're used to thinking of really through since the Renaissance period that has been our model of thinking about um, art and artistic creativity. But she wants to upend that a little bit. And let me read, let's see. Here's a quote from Sherry Levine. She says she likes to make, try to make art, and I'm quoting her here, which celebrates doubt and uncertainty, which provokes answers but doesn't give them, which withholds absolute meaning by incorporating parasite meanings. 
which suspends meaning while perpetually dispatching you toward interpretation, urging you beyond dogmatism, beyond doctrine, beyond ideology, beyond authority. And that's really key here. What she's trying to do is to raise questions about the image, right? I mean, after all, when Walker Evans created this image, the woman who's actually represented in this photograph, the subject of the image, Abby Mae Burroughs, um, she doesn't get credited for being a collaborative part of the photograph. She doesn't get fame and fortune. She just gets re represented as an, an image. Um, so where, you know, who's taking the image, who has the right, who's the author, who's the authority here? Uh, I've got a link in this week, I believe it is, to a website which is called After Sherry Levine where um, somebody has scanned a photograph, um, I think it's after Walker Evans, by Sherry Levine and then has put it up on the web and now that website is raising the same sets of questions. Well, I've taken this and, you know, is this Sherry Levine's now or does this belong to me? Is there anybody who really is the author, quote unquote, of this photograph? Now, she's also referencing the idea of artistic tradition because the photographers who she also does um, photographs after um, Edward Weston, another mid-century photographer who's quite important and famous. Um, and what critics have said is, well, she's, you know, she's borrowing from these guys just the way that they borrowed their forms and their composition from people who came before them. So just because hers is more obvious doesn't mean that it's any more um, uncreative, right? Or, I mean, this is, this is all... Um, just replicating the same kind of activity that Weston and Walker were themselves engaged in. So she's um, a copy, making a copy of a copy of a copy, essentially. Uh, now, she goes and branches out from photography by the 90s, so she starts doing other works that are copied after or modeled after the work that has come before her. Here's classic example, her fountain after Marcel Duchamp from 1991. This is a bronze version of the famous fountain that we started out the semester with. Remember Marcel Duchamp's uh, fountain from 1917, which he had submitted to uh, a, a annual... Um, unjuried exhibition with the sort of challenge to the Society for Independent Artists to accept it as a piece of sculpture. And Duchamp had made the argument that, yes, it was prefabricated, it was something that he had purchased, but it was the artist's activity of putting it into a new context that made it a work of art. It was the concept and not the retina that made it important. Now here is Levine coming along after Duchamp and saying, um, you know, this is my work of art. It's a um, sculpture after the work of Marcel Duchamp. And here you will notice that it's not a literal copy. I mean, it's not a cast of the actual fountain of Marcel Duchamp. It is not an actual urinal that she's purchased and put on its side. It's a bronze replica, right? So she's made it into a kind of um, the, the sort of classic material of sculpture going back to the ancient Greeks, right? She's taken it from its mass-produced um, porcelain utilitarian functional plumbing context that was Marcel Duchamp's radical innovation to put it in the uh, museum. Now Sherry Levine has taken the actual shape itself and then turned it into and taken that mass-produced object and then she's made a version that's actually a um, high-end art object in the media and materials that are associated with the history of sculpture in the West. She also does, and she, she takes her aim basically at the pantheon of modernist artists in the early 20th century. So not only Duchamp, uh, but also all the, all the sort of big names like Constantine Brancusi here. So here is her Black Newborn, which is marble sculpture that's basically a replica of a sculpture that Constantine Brancusi had done in the early 20th century that is also called um, Newborn. And there's a whole series of these egg-shaped egg-shaped um, images. So there's on the left Brancusi's newborn, and he did series, uh, versions in white and versions in um, black, uh, and so she does a kind of recreation of that. Uh, let me see, I'm reading um, 
a couple of quotes here from an interview from Sherry Levine. She says, um, you know, in the whole history of art, uh, one of the things that had really been true until the early 20th century was, um, you know, artists would use the same stock imagery in creating, for example, altarpieces in the Renaissance, things like that. Uh, let's see. She says also, so much of our sense of art history is based on copies, fakes, and forgeries. Um, entire museum collections, she says, are forgeries. And she also says, uh, oh yeah, okay, also why she chooses to do a lot of um, appropriating of the work of male artists. A lot of what my work has been about since the beginning has been realizing the difficulties of situating myself in the art world as a woman because the art world is so much an arena for the celebration of male desire. And that is, again, a very typical kind of feminist critique of the history of art in the West that so much of art is about looking at the nude female form or making women into the objects of art rather than um, active creating subjects in art. Another artist who emerges in the 80s and then in the 90s as an appropriationist who is also really kind of taking on the 20th century masters and recreating them and then kind of calling into question the whole notion of originality um, because one of the things in this case that Mike Bidlow does is he does such good copies of these masterpiece paintings. They're so spot on that you start to wonder what was so creative or so original about the original work. And here I'm just showing you one example of his, uh, of the kind of work that he does. This is from the 80s. This is called Not Picasso. It is a copy, if you've taken 20th century European art, you'll recognize this, uh, or if you've taken A110, the, a copy of one of Picasso's most famous paintings at the beginning of Cubism, Demoiselle d'Avignon from 1984. Uh, and here's an installation of Bidlow's, uh, in Bidlow's studio where he has done copies of some of the most famous paintings and painters of the 20th century. So we have there a uh, Joan Miro uh, at the bottom left. Behind there, you might recognize from all the broken crockery, this is a copy of, and here, this is a guy who's doing these copies right after the originals are done. The back left broken crockery painting is a Julian Schnabel painting, or Schnabel, excuse me, Julian Schnabel painting. The woman in the center holding the red pillar is a, a, a Fernand Leger. Uh, then there's the, the painting of the before and after nose job. It's an Andy Warhol. Uh, should recognize um, the Brancusi sculpture. You should recognize the bicycle wheel of Marcel Duchamp. And then on the back right there is a copy after Jackson Pollock. Uh, and so this has been Mike Bidlow's project, is to take all of these um, landmarks of the 20th century and then recreate them himself. And again, by doing this and doing such spot-on copies, he is kind of challenging the notion of the uniqueness of an individual artist's hand, um, calling into question the whole idea of the absolute originality and sacredness of the singular work of art. These are postmodernist ideas that come from um, really theory and critical writing that was being done in academic circles in um, in uh, literature for example and your uh, reading on postmodernism has a good sort of explanation of the history of this so it's a sort of theoretical idea or a philosophy if you will postmodernism that you see in art manifested concretely in a number of different ways and one of the ways is this kind of copying from the art of the past with the idea of questioning or calling into question the whole notion of originality and artistic uniqueness. Even Jackson Pollock really comes under um, uh, under fire by, from Mike Bidlow where Bidlow does a whole series um, uh, that's both performance and painting where he mimics the original or the paintings of Jackson Pollock and does this whole performance where he even recreates a very famous event that is supposed to have happened at Peggy Guggenheim's apartment. Peggy Guggenheim was a major collector of 20th century art and a huge patron of Jackson Pollock's and in fact commissioned him to do a mural in her house and was a real tastemaker for collectors in the 20th century. A little bit like Charles Saatchi has been in the last 
to 15 years. Uh, Peggy Guggenheim was a major supporter of Pollux, and he was at a cocktail party at her house once, quite quite drunk, and uh, went and urinated in her fireplace instead of in the uh, bathroom, uh, or at least... This is uh, alleged to have happened. And, of course, you know, Fitz Jackson Pollock's sort of image as being this wild child uh, who couldn't be constrained by petty bourgeois values like using the toilet uh, instead of the fireplace. So um, so Bidlow recreated all of that up to and including peeing in the fireplace just to kind of, um, you know, play with that notion of Jackson Pollock as this kind of unique guy who was a one of a kind who nobody else could have done what he had done. All right, let's see. Uh, this is in Bidlow's studio where you can see he's done these spot on um, recreations of Leger, of De Chirico, of uh, Matisse, of uh, there's Gertrude Stein, Pablo Picasso's Gertrude Stein. There's also a, a Warhol, um, uh, Marilyn, and then there's a Man Ray painting, that lip painting in the back. So he's done all of these you know, amazing copies, or if you wanted to put it another way, forgeries of these 20th century masterpieces. In 1997, he did a, uh, a, a basically a, a install, an installation at a gallery in the bathroom of the gallery based upon uh, Duchamp's fountain from 1917, where he did all these drawings that became wallpaper in the bathroom at the gallery, and then these sculptures that are replicas of, and you can see he's also put on the floor there, a Buddha. This is a reference to one of Duchamp's famous uh, defenses of the fountain, that you know when he looked at it, he saw the shape of the Virgin Mary or the shape of a Buddha, and people who looked at the fountain and saw a urinal were just people who had dirty minds, right? Uh, this was for a series called Saint Duchamp or Saint Duchamp in, in French. Uh, Saint Duchamp in French is a Saint Duchamp is a homonym for without Duchamp. Um, so it's either S A I N T for Saint Duchamp or S A N S, Saint Duchamp. Uh, so there's a little wordplay going on there, which is, again, an homage to um, Duchamp himself, who was very into word games. Um, and this is his. This is his uh, installation in the bathroom there from 1997 of this uh, of this gallery, where again you know he's he's appropriating the work of Duchamp and here kind of playing with all the theoretical implications of Duchamp in a postmodern context. And this is just a close up of his fountain drawings from 1998, which is the basis for the wallpaper at the gallery. And of course, this is one of his. Um, not Duchamp's. He calls his works not whomever. So whoever's work he's appropriating, he calls it, it's not Duchamp, it's not Warhol, not Leger, whoever he's uh, um, taking on. And again, that is part of the postmodern challenge to the whole um, history of art and also to this kind of um, what we really see at its height in the modern period, particularly in the work of people like the abstract expressionists, this very kind of serious and high-minded idea that it is this unique vision of each individual artist that is, you know, irreplaceable and sort of sa uh, uh, sacred that is being taken on by the postmodernists. So there's a very different attitude here among postmodernist art and artists than we find in the kind of pinnacle of modernism with the abstract expressionists. And of course, let's see, not Duchamp's bottle rack. And again, bottle rack was one of uh, Duchamp's ready-mades. And so here he has made this sort of, um, these are bespoke, you know, one of, or, or handmade replicas of something that originally had been a mass-produced object. Bidlow also takes on guys like Andy Warhol, so here's not Warhol. We've seen Warhol's Brillo boxes. Here, you know, Bidlow's just adding another layer to the game, right? Warhol went and took something out of pop culture, out of commercial culture, turned it into a um, handmade replica of an, a mass-produced object, and now Bidlow is reproducing a handmade reproduction of a handmade reproduction. It's a copy of a copy of a copy. I mean, it's a little bit like going down the rabbit hole when you start looking at this kind of appropriationist art. But, I mean, this is something that emerges out of postmodern questioning of the whole modernist paradigm. And let's see, Bidlow, let's see, not Picasso. So this just gives you an idea of, you know, he does really good copies of the originals that are almost undetectable. 
And uh, again, he gets known for doing his not Pollocks. In fact, he becomes so well known for this that when Ed Harris was producing that movie Pollock in 2000, in uh, 90 and 2000, uh, he actually hired Mike Bidlow to help him learn how to paint like Jackson Pollock. And there's uh, Ed Harris as Jackson Pollock in the movie Pollock, which is um, sort of a, a, a docudrama um, biography of Pollock, fictionalized biography of Pollock. Uh, so here's Harris painting as Pollock, and he literally had hired Bidlow to help him learn how to do Pollock-style painting. So, you know, there's just even another layer of the performance added on to this kind of, um, uh, this kind of thing. Let's see, another artist who really is an appropriationist and a postmodernist is this guy, Mark Tanzi. This is his purity test from 1982. And if you look closely at the painting towards the middle distance there, you'll see what he has appropriated from another artist. That is, of course, Robert Smithson's spiral jetty out there in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Now, Tanzi. And there's a whole series of his paintings available from a link online. I'm just going to talk about this one because I think it gives you a little it window into um, the kind of work that he does. Tansy appropriates the work of other artists, sometimes a la Mike Bidlow by copying the painting, um, but usually by with putting something else in or adding a twist. And here um, he's put Smithson Spiral Jetty in the background, and here in the foreground he has a group of Native Americans looking down over the... Um, over the cliff at the spiral jetty. Now one of the things that is interesting about Tansy is his parents are both actually art historians and so he grew up being very conscious of the whole history of art and that really seems to play out in his work which is partly dealing with questions of of um, you know authorship and uh, and questions of um, you know, artistic genius and artistic authority. And partly, like in this painting, I mean, there's something interesting going on here. Purity test, that title could suggest a number of things. Uh, and what scholars have pointed out is, you know, Smithson said his direct inspiration for Spiral Jetty was actually the mound builders of the Ohio region and particularly the Great Serpent Mound. And you can really see that when you see the spiral in the tail of the Great Serpent Mound. So, are these Native Americans looking down at Spiral Jetty and giving it a purity test for how pure its um, you know, relationship to Native American culture is? Are these Native Americans, the are they purely Native Americans so that they are the subjects of the purity test? Unclear exactly where Tansy puts the purity test um, in, but I mean, this is part of what he's trying to do is raise questions about art and about artistic genius and creativity. Uh, you know, was, or was Smithson's um, work pure in its, you know, lack of reference, right? I mean, um, I hope you see what I'm getting at here. So Tansy's raising all these questions about Smithson, raising questions about originality and, uh, and influence and things like that. And you'll see more of his work online. He's particularly interesting as a postmodernist artist who is challenging the history of art and, um, and doing works that are raising questions about the idea of genius and originality. Another kind of appropriation starts to happen in the 1990s, in particular with artists like Fred Wilson. Uh, part of postmodernism is to raise questions about and to challenge the whole idea of authorial genius and um, artistic originality. And another part of postmodernism is um, incorporating some of the other things that we have been reading about, like identity politics or like um, co post-colonial theory. Uh, now, Fred Wilson is an artist who's African American, and he has taken as part of his kind of you know working uh, philosophy is to really look not so much at art history, but the history of museums and museum display, because that is something that is actually quite tied up with identity politics. Uh, case in point, a recent installation that Fred Wilson did was he went into um, 
Oh, I think it was a museum in San Francisco. And he changed the wall labels in the European galleries to read, instead of saying, you know, this is a painting that's oil on canvas, he labeled them all painted textiles. Which makes sense because, of course, canvas is painted fabric, right? Uh, or oil on canvas is painted textile. But um, typically in museums, paintings that are European in origin are labeled as paintings oil on canvas. If it were a Native American painting on an animal skin, or if it were an African woven textile or um, textile that had been painted on, it would be labeled or fabric that had been painted for some reason, it would be labeled painted textile. Uh, the point here being that different cultures get different kinds of labels assigned, assigned to them by museum staff. And so the way that we think about those objects and then the cultures that produce them is influenced by the way that they are displayed and described in official contexts like museums. So Wilson's one of his main um, ways of working is to go into museums and rearrange the stuff that's already there. So it's a different kind of appropriation than what we're looking at with Mike Bidlow, for example. This is one of his earliest and probably most um, kind of news-making uh, versions of this kind of work that Fred Wilson did in Baltimore at the um, at the Baltimore or the the Museum of uh, Maryland History. He was invited by the curatorial staff there to come in, root around in their collection, and come up with a new way to display um, artifacts from their collection on the second floor. And so this is what he did. Of course, Maryland was a slave-owning state. Uh, it was um, uh, and one of the earliest colonies to be founded. So there's a long history there and lots of objects to, to work with. So here is cabinet making, 1820 to 1960 a room in this installation, which that obviously is a very typical kind of uh, label or title to give to a room in a museum display, cabinet making 1820 to 1960. As you can see here from that little inset picture and then from this close-up though, he has included some objects together that are not typically shown together at the at the Baltimore Museum or the Maryland Historical Society. Uh, for example, you have all this beautiful woodworked um, furniture, chairs, right? And included with them is something you wouldn't normally see, which is a whipping post. This is a wooden object shaped like a cross, functioning a little bit like a cross. A, a slave who had been disobedient would be tied to this post, the hands tied to either end of the crossbeam. Uh, and then that would make it possible to whip the person on the back more easily. It's slightly tilted so that the person would be leaning slightly against it with their arms tied tightly to the crossbars, and that would leave their back completely open for, um, for whipping. Now, he's also arranged the chairs here in a rather spooky fashion to suggest that the people who would be sitting in that elegant furniture would be sitting watching the person being whipped almost as if they were watching television, almost as if it were entertainment. So in this arrangement where you find things that aren't normally put together, association, associations that aren't normally made in the museum context being made here quite explicit and uh, as a real critique of the slave owning history of Maryland um, this is his appropriation it's challenging the uh, the um, authority of the museum to write a particular kind of sanitized version of history in that same show, which was called Mining the Museum, in another room, he displayed in a display case uh, metalwork, 1790 to 1880, which, as you can see, is this incredibly opulent set of, um, of goblets and uh, tea services in, made in silver included in this case. And included in the case is also a set of shackles that would have been attached to the ankles of an enslaved person, okay? Ironwork shackles making visible and explicit the connection between the extraordinary wealth of the slave-owning people of Maryland and the brutality of the system that created that wealth. Again, 
not the kind of association that's typically made in a museum setting and so one that is being done very consciously here to critique not only the history but also the normal display in the museum again very much part of the postmodern project of questioning the whole history of art and the relationships, the power relationships that are inherent in the way that we tell our stories and our histories, even our art histories. Uh, so this is another part of Mining the Museum by Fred Wilson. And again, it's appropriating the stuff that's in the museum and reusing it in this context. That show was a very interesting show. I mean, it's been 16 years now since it was done. The Maryland Historical Society kept a visitor's book and they uh, let people write in, you know, their comments. and. Um, lots of just really emotional responses to a show like this. You know, it really was, um, some people really loved it and felt that it was, you know, about time that some of these issues were addressed. Some people felt like the past is the past and, you know, let sleeping dogs lie. Uh, but everybody was engaged, right? Everybody came out of this show thinking about the issues that Wilson had raised and really talking about them, whether they were pro or con. Um, this is another example. I mean, Wilson has gone on, he does lots of these kinds of interventions, as you might call them, where he re repositions stuff in the museum or relabels it to try to get you to really think about what's going on inside a museum. Uh, and one of the things that he critiques, and actually others have critiqued as well, and this comes partly out of post-colonial theory, looking at the relationship between um, colonizing countries and the colonized, um, is the display of people inside museums. And so, for example, here in Friendly Natives, where you've got a skeleton on display, I mean, you, it's not uncommon to find people or, or their skeletons on display in natural history museums, but it's, it's typically not, you know, uh, white people who would be on display. It would be, here are the remains of Native Americans on display in a museum or um, of African captives, things like that. So here, this is... Um, he had four skeletons that he put in cases and he labeled them somebody's sister, somebody's mother, you know, somebody's father. Um, just to try to get people to realize that what they're looking at is not just a scientific curiosity, but the remains of a human being. Here from 1991 is his Guarded View. This was at the Whitney Biennial, which is a, a every two year show of, of important contemporary American artists. And in 1991, um, Wilson put these mannequins on display with, they're clothed in the um, security guard uniforms from four major museums in New York City. Uh, as you can see, the mannequins are all somewhat um, dark-skinned, so they're meant to suggest to you African-American guards, and they're all headless. Uh, Wilson did this partly because to kind of comment on his experiences in the art world. Um, like many art students in New York, he had worked part-time as a security guard at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in order to support himself. Um, and he, you know, this, this sort of invisibility of the security guard in the museum is one of his subjects here. Um, here you're, you're seeing, you know, these uniforms on display as artwork, and it's also meant to kind of challenge the viewer to think about their own perceptions. Um, Wilson found that even when he was having openings at major museums, when he was not work after he was had worked as a security guard, when he was not in uniform, that he would often be mistaken for either a security guard or for a member of the catering staff because he's African American. So people would just come up to him and hand him an empty glass assuming he was, you know, responsible for taking their trash and, you know, throwing it away. Uh, and so this is a kind of commentary on that uh, on that part of his experience of the museum world. And there's Wilson in 2001 at a retrospective and a reinstallation of this show uh, out in Los Angeles. And he gave a talk about the, the, the meaning of this um, particular piece of work. And lots of Wilson's pieces, lots of his installations, are dealing either implicitly or explicitly with ideas about race and the display of race or the lack of display of race in a museum context. Here in gray area from 1993, he's taken replicas of a bust of Nefertiti, one of the most famous artifacts of um, Egyptian culture that's from the, um, or it belongs in, I think it's a museum in Berlin in the museum there. 
now, but it's one of the most famous icons of Egypt. And one of the things that's kind of weird that's happened over the course of Egyptology and the history of writing about Egypt is that many um, archaeologists, especially in the 19th century and early 20th century, tried to make a racial argument that Nefertiti and the pharaohs of Egypt were actually white rather than black. And that has been the subject of a lot of um, revision in recent years as people have gone back and looked at the evidence and looked at the archaeology um, to kind of re re imagine or rethink what it is that Egypt was all about. And in fact, there's been a particularly um, strong movement led by the publication of a book called Black Athena that is a, a book that argues for, um, you know, the, the presence of black Africans in world history, particularly in the history of Egypt. And um, there's a kind of intellectual tug of war that's gone on over this. And that's what Fred Wilson is is implicitly discussing in gray area where you have his bust of Nefertiti that has been painted um, in gradations from very you know completely white to completely black and then shades in between where he's sort of you know suggesting that there um, there is or should be some movement between these polar extremes Okay, so another artist who is also appropriating the museum itself and then kind of calling into question the way that museums represent people and history is this um, man named James Luna, Native American man from California, who um, has done a series of installations and performance pieces that, that talk about Native American identity. In fact, he was most recently at the 2000, 2007 Venice Biennale, so he has become a really big deal in the art world. Um, you don't get invited to, the, invited to the Venice Biennale until you have really made a name for yourself on the national and international art scene. So Luna um, started out about 25 years ago doing pieces like this and now you know, has become a really big deal. This is his artifact piece from the 1980s, and in this piece... He actually, that's him laying down in a glass display case with an open top. And this was meant to, uh, and it's, so it's a performance piece installation. And it was meant to comment on and get people to think about the display of Native Americans in museums. I don't know how much of this you're aware of, but I mean, this has become in the last 20 years a subject of some real um, emotional and intense controversy because for the 19th and early 20th century, museums like the Smithsonian, when they did um, studies of Native American life and culture, one of the things they did was they collected um, skeletons, and not skeletons of long dead people, but like somebody would die and they would um, basically take that person's skeleton, sometimes under questionable means, clean up the bones, um, and I, I mean, this is gross to think about, but they would take a skull of a person and boil it down so all the flesh was gone and it would be cleaned off, essentially, and then they'd keep the skull in their collection. And many Native American groups have been lobbying Congress and the Smithsonian to return those remains to different, um, you know, to, to their... Um, tribe or ethnic group because uh, they want to be able to bury those people, give them a proper burial. And there's a whole process you have to go through to prove that there's some relationship, some actual genetic relationship between a living person and one of those sets of remains at the mu museum. Um, you know, archaeological practice has changed somewhat, and anthropological practice has changed somewhat over the past 30 years. That used to just be acceptable to keep the remains of human beings in drawers. I mean, not if they were white and mainstream, but if they were Native Americans and then classified as sort of specimens or artifacts. And that's what Luna is doing here, or questioning here. Um, the, the story goes that, you know, he would lay there for eight hours a day, taking a few breaks, but laying there, and he had... Um, several labels, you can just barely see them here, in the display case with him. And so the labels say things like, you know, here are signs of diabetes. Diabetes is a, a disease that um, disproportionately affects, 
affects the Native American population or, you know, early signs of alcoholism, um, all these sort of stereotypical things about, uh, ideas about Native Americans represented in those placards. The idea was that people would come through this big exhibit, they would be looking at, um, you know, this display and talking to each other about this display. Oh, wow, yeah, he really looks like, and, you know, he's got, um, I don't know, early cirrhosis or whatever. And um, over the course of a couple minutes standing there, they would start to realize that this was not just a um, mannequin on display. They would start to see his chest rising and falling. Maybe he would sneeze, you know, maybe he'd adjust his position slightly so they'd see his toes wiggle or something like that. And it would make them become aware that the subject, the thing they were talking about as an object, was hearing everything they said. Okay, this is meant to be a piece that challenges your typical kind of treatment of or thinking about um, the stuff you see in a museum, all right? So again, a different kind of intervention or, or um, appropriation than Sherry Levine or uh, Mike Bidlow, but also meant to kind of challenge the master narratives of uh, the culture. Um, so again, part of taking part of um, part in postmodernist theory and then just with a slightly different focus. Um, James Luna has continued to do these kinds of pieces, and again, I mean, there's interesting stuff in this because, of course, taking uh, going all the way back to Duchamp saying the viewer completes the work of art, I mean, Luna's pieces require an audience to really start to make sense, to really become, you know, the full thing that they are. This is Luna's Take a Picture with a Real Indian, a performance piece he's done in several locations in the last 15 years. Um, what you can see there are th on the right are three cutout life-size photographs of James Luna dressed up in different costumes. Um, a loincloth, then a sort of stereotypical Plains Indian getup, and then uh, in modern dress. And he had these three cardboard cut cutouts set up, and you can see that on the left there, there's the, the cardboard cutouts set up. And he's sitting in a chair there um, watching and getting ready to take photographs. The idea was that the audience would come and they would have to choose which of the three cutouts was a real Indian and they would stand next to that Indian, um, uh, that cutout of James Luna, and get their picture taken. This is actually something that, I'm not sure if it still goes on, but at least 10 years ago in the West, you could go to some reservations and do this very thing. They would have people would get dressed up in costume, um, that is Native Americans would get dressed up in costume and then for five bucks or whatever you could stand next to that person and get your picture taken. Now, so Luna is taking on that idea and then he's also challenging the people who come to the exhibit. Which of these is the real Indian? They're all three pictures of James Luna, but obviously some are more fulfilling these kind of un, un or these stereotypes of a Native American uh, more than others, right? Is the real Indian James Luna in his everyday street clothes or is it James Luna dressed up in a loincloth? And so the, in, the um, onus is on the viewer to choose the answer that they think is correct and then um, take their picture with that version of an Indian, okay? Meant to make you think, what is a real Indian, right? Uh, and so this is another way that you know, this is a kind of appropriation and then an intervention in um, challenging the, the, no, the, the dominant culture. Okay, so that's all that I have for today. And your next lecture is about video art in the 1990s. Have a great day.